Hello everyone. So in this free lecture tutorial I wanted to explain how the periodic table can actually help us to build electron configurations. Up until this point basically what we've been doing is we've been looking up an element in the periodic table and we've been looking at its atomic number. So for example in this slide eventually we're going to be writing out the electron configuration for the element antimony. And so antimony is right here in the periodic table and we were looking at the atomic number we saw that it was 51 and then we would go and we would proceed to use our pyramid chart to go and actually start filling in all 51 electrons into their associated orbitals based on the Aufbau principle and the Pauli exclusion principle and Hund's rule and that will always work however you should be aware that the periodic table is actually set up to help us to do that uh, the way that this concept works is we can conceive of the periodic table being divided up into separate blocks and each block corresponds to filling a specific sublevel and so for example the first two groups of the periodic table groups one and two basically they represent the filling of the S block now also in this first period, in period number one, there are only two elements. And so basically, if I were to travel across the first period from hydrogen to helium, that represents the filling of the 1s sublevel. But basically, from that point forward, as I move between group one and group two, as I go from the second period to the third or the fourth and so on, basically, that represents filling the 2s sublevel the 3s sublevel, the 4s, 5s, 6s, and 7s. Um, if I were to look at groups 13 through 18 in the periodic table, basically that represents six elements in every period. And if you recall, basically it's also true that there are six orbitals in each p sublevel. And so as I travel across a period going from groups 13 through 18, that's actually modeling filling the P sublevel for that particular period. So here in the second period I'd be filling the 2P sublevel. This element right here would have its final electron in 2P1. Then the next one would be 2P2, 2P3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. If I look at the transition metals, here there are 10 elements. So basically there were two elements in groups 1 and 2 modeling the filling of the S sublevel. There are six elements in what we're going to call the P block because basically that models filling the six orbitals in the P sublevel. And if you notice the transition metals, there are 10 elements and those 10 elements actually represent filling electrons into the D sublevel. However, please note that basically the D sublevels lag one principal, num uh, one principal quantum number behind the 4s and the 4p, for example. Basically, this is the 3d sublevel, and it fills in the fourth period in between the 4s and the 4p. Similarly, if I go to the next period, basically the 5s will fill, but then the corresponding d sublevel that fills in that same period actually is one principal quantum number behind, so that's the 4d sublevel that's filling. As I move from the beginning of the transition metals to the end and then once I'm through with the 4d sublevel and move into the corresponding p sublevel in the fifth period then I jump back up to the 5p and that 5p sublevel will fill and then so on going down the periods. Uh, if you recall though there are also f orbitals that are used to fill electrons into the atomic structure for the elements that we're familiar with uh, and so those fill actually down here in what we call the lanthanide and the actinide series. And so as we travel across the lanthanides and the actinides, and recall remember that these elements should sort of be tucked in in this space right here, okay, basically what's going to happen is I'm going to fill 14 spots or I should say uh, 14 potential electrons can fill into the seven orbitals of the F sublevel. And so as a result, basically if I travel across the 
lanthanide and the actinide series, that model's filling the 14 electrons into the seven orbitals of the F sublevel. And so what this does is it provides a sort of a blueprint that we can follow that makes it a whole lot easier to actually determine an electron configuration without having to draw the orbitals out and count electrons from beginning to end. So let's actually use this to work a problem. As I said, we're going to go ahead and write out the electron configuration for antimony. And antimony is here in the periodic table. So again, basically, I'm going to start with hydrogen and literally walk across the periodic table until I get to antimony, filling the appropriate orbitals as I go and I travel through the blocks. So I have to start at hydrogen and I have to pass from hydrogen to helium. So that's 1s2. Then between lithium and beryllium, that's 2s2. I then have to pass through the remainder of the elements in the second period that are in the p block. And there are six of those elements, so that's 2p6. Now I'm up to sodium. So I have to travel from sodium to magnesium, so that's 3s2. And then I have to travel through the six elements in that p block in the third period, so that would be 3p6. Then potassium and calcium would represent filling electrons in the 4s2 sublevel. Then I have the 10 elements in the d block next to calcium, but remember that D sublevel is one principal quantum number lower than the 4s2, so that would be 3d10. And then I'll be traveling across the 6p block elements in the fourth period, so that would be 4p6. Now I'm up to the fifth period, so rubidium and strontium, so that would be 5s2. Then I have to traverse all of the elements in the D block within the fifth period. But again, recall that this D sublevel is one principal quantum number lower than the 5S sublevel, so that would be 4D10. And then I'm going to travel three more elements within that 5P subblock. And so that means I'm going to get 5P3. And so there's the complete electron configuration for antimony. Now, as always, I could have used noble gas notation or abbreviated electron configuration notation. And so in order to do that, I'm going to find the noble gas that precedes antimony. So that would be krypton. So krypton ends the fourth period. So that means that all of the electron configuration through 4p6, this piece right here, can be condensed down to krypton's electron configuration. So I'll put krypton in square brackets, and then the remainder of the electron configuration is placed just to the right of that. And then that would be the noble gas notation for antimony. Now, one thing that I do have to mention is you have to be careful within the D block if you're assigned a D block element to actually write the configuration for. Um, because what happens is within the D block, you have a lot of exceptions to these filling rules. Now we'll discuss in class exactly why those exceptions exist. But I'll give you a couple of examples. Suppose I wanted to do the electron configuration for chromium and for copper. Okay, I'm going to take chromium first. And I'll go ahead and write the noble gas notation. So argon precedes chromium. So this would be argon. And we would expect that the configuration would be 4s2 and then 3d1234. 3d4. But that is not actually what we get. What we actually get is actually one electron from the S sublevel is going to jump over to the D. So that would give me 4S1, 3D5. And the reason for that is if I were to go and expand this D sublevel, remember that there are 
five orbitals in the 3D sublevel. And then here's the 4S. If I model the expected configuration that I showed you earlier, then doing the orbital diagram, or the abbreviated orbital diagram, I'd get this. Okay, notice that the 3D sublevel only has one empty orbital. And so what's going to happen is one electron from the 4S is going to jump over and fill that vacancy so that you end up with all of the orbitals half filled. When you have an electron configuration where everything is half filled, that's very stable. And so as a result, that's why we see this ex exception to the filling rules. Basically, it's more stable if the chromium atom does this with its electron configuration as opposed to if it did that. And so that's why we get that exception. Um, something sim uh, similar happens if we consider copper. If I take a look at copper in the periodic table, again, the preceding noble gas would be argon, and we would expect that the configuration would be 4s2, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 3d9. But what we really get is 4s1, 3d10. And it's similar to what I showed you for chromium. Okay, here's the 4s sublevel. Here's the 3D. If I go ahead and fill the orbitals in this orbital diagram to model the configuration I gave you for what we would expect for copper, there would only be one empty spot in this final orbital in the 3D sublevel. And so if I could manage to completely fill the 3D sublevel, then that would actually give me a very stable configuration as well. And so the exact same thing happens to copper that happens to chromium. One electron sort of jumps over into the 3D orbital that has an opening, and you end up with this instead, where all of the electrons completely fill the 3D sublevel, and you do end up with the vacancy in the 4s instead. So this is what you actually get for copper instead. Um, as you go and travel to the 4d sublevel in the 5d and the 6d uh, within the d block, basically these exceptions occur more and more frequently. Um, you don't have to worry about memorizing those. Um, I'm not going to try to, you know, catch a napping, you know, with these exceptions. Um, the important point is that you should be aware that they do exist. And you should also be aware that, again, uh, there's a reason for that. It has to do with the closeness of the energy levels at that particular juncture in the atoms architecture, which we're actually going to discuss in class. Uh, but for now, work on the follow-up assignment to this tutorial. Again, if there are any questions, please bring them up in class or feel free to email. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a good night.